Adain, a 16-year-old girl from the village of Aboabo, had known hardship from a young age. When her mother passed away, she was left in the care of her stepfather, Kofi, a man whose kindness had withered after her mother's death. Though Adain was known throughout the village for her beauty, with her curving figure and deep, soulful eyes, her heart carried the heavy burden of her mother's absence and Kofi's growing cruelty. In the evenings, when the village settled into silence, Kofi would look at her in ways that made her skin crawl. He no longer saw her as a child, but as something to possess. Adain, though young, sensed the danger in his gaze and dreaded each nightfall when they would be alone in the small house. The village boys would gather wherever Adain went. They admired her beauty from afar, some bolder ones offering sweet words in hopes of catching her attention. To them, she was the epitome of grace and charm, a girl destined for great love. Yet, none of them knew the weight of the life she lived behind closed doors. Adain had no time for the affection of the village boys. She lived in constant fear of her stepfather, whose attempts to force himself on her became more aggressive each day. The once lively girl who used to laugh and dance now walked with her head bowed, avoiding eye contact with anyone. Her beauty, which brought admiration from others, had become a curse in her own home. Kofi's anger grew as Adain resisted him. He would berate her, calling her ungrateful, and often refused to give her food. His cruelty didn't stop there, he would make her do heavy chores around the house, hoping to break her spirit. Adain, though terrified, refused to show weakness. She clung to the memory of her mother, praying each night for guidance and strength. She wondered if there was anyone out there who could save her from this nightmare. The village, despite its beauty and simplicity, felt like a prison, and her home was the darkest cell of all. Each night she wondered how long she could endure, or if Kofi's cruelty would finally overpower her strength. In an attempt to escape Kofi's wrath, Adain began selling oranges at the village market. It was a small relief from the suffocating atmosphere of home. As she stood by the roadside, her hands busily peeling oranges for customers, she allowed herself to dream of a different life, a life where she wasn't hunted by fear. Selling oranges brought her a sense of independence, albeit small. She found solace in the smiles of strangers, and though the boys still flocked around her, she remained distant, guarded. She had no room in her heart for affection, not with the shadow of Kofi's evil looming over her every moment. One day, while selling her oranges, an old woman approached Adain. Her face was wrinkled with age, her movements slow but deliberate. She had a presence about her that made Adain pause. The woman asked for water, her voice soft yet commanding. Without hesitation, Adain offered her a cup, her hands trembling slightly. The woman took a slow sip, her eyes never leaving Adain's face. You have a kind heart, my child, the woman said, her voice filled with warmth and a familiarity that sent shivers down Adain's spine. Do not lose hope. Your mother is watching over you, always. Adain's breath caught in her throat. How did this woman know? She hadn't mentioned her mother to anyone in years. The old woman smiled knowingly before disappearing into the crowd, leaving Adain to wonder if it had all been a dream. That night, as Adain lay on her mat, her mind was filled with thoughts of the old woman. Could it have been her mother's spirit in disguise? She had felt an overwhelming sense of peace in her presence, something she hadn't felt in years. The thought filled her heart with a fragile hope. Adain whispered a quiet prayer to her mother, asking for strength to survive another day. She felt the old woman's words resonate deep within her soul, do not lose hope. Her mother's spirit was with her, and somehow, that thought gave her the strength to keep going, to face whatever would come next. Days turned into weeks, and Adain continued her routine of selling oranges. One afternoon, as the sun began to set, a young man approached her stall. His name was Kwame, a hunter known throughout the village for his skill and bravery. 
He had heard of Adain's beauty but was taken aback by the sadness in her eyes. Kwame purchased an orange, his gaze lingering on her face. You look like someone who carries the weight of the world on her shoulders, he said softly, his voice filled with concern. Adain was taken aback by his words, not used to such kindness from a stranger. She gave him a small, tired smile and handed him the orange, not realizing that this simple exchange would be the start of something much greater. Kwame began visiting Adain more frequently. Though their conversations were brief, they grew more comfortable with each other. Kwame, with his gentle demeanor and kind eyes, made Adain feel safe in a way she hadn't felt in a long time. He never pried into her life, but Adain sensed that he knew there was more to her story than she let on. As the days passed, she found herself looking forward to his visits. His presence was a small light in the overwhelming darkness of her life. For the first time in years, Adain began to feel something stir within her, hope, perhaps even the beginnings of love. Back at home, Kofi grew more dangerous. His advances became more aggressive, and his anger, more explosive when Adain rebuffed him. One night, in a fit of rage, he tried to force himself on her, but Adain fought back, screaming until the neighbors came rushing in, forcing Kofi to retreat. The shame of the encounter weighed heavily on her, but she knew she could not stay in that house much longer. She realized her escape would not come from enduring Kofi's wrath but from finding a way to leave the life she had known behind. Perhaps the spirit of her mother had come to guide her to that very escape. And perhaps Kwame, with his kind heart and quiet strength, was a part of that escape too. The next morning after Kofi's violent attempt, Adain woke up feeling fragile. She could barely move, the bruises on her arms from Kofi's grip serving as a cruel reminder of her life at home. She sat by the roadside with her oranges but couldn't focus. The village boys noticed her swollen eyes, but no one dared ask her what was wrong. Later that afternoon, as Kwame approached her stall, he immediately saw something was wrong. Adain was different today, more distant, more fragile. He bought an orange and, instead of leaving, he sat next to her in silence. The air between them was heavy with unspoken words, but Kwame didn't push. He was patient, knowing that Adain would speak when she was ready. After what felt like hours, Adain finally broke her silence. I can't go home anymore, she whispered, her voice trembling. I don't know what to do. Her words were like a dam breaking, releasing the flood of emotions she had been holding in for so long. Kwame listened carefully, his heart heavy with concern. Kwame's heart ached as Adain recounted the horror she had endured at the hands of her stepfather. He had sensed that something was wrong, but hearing the truth filled him with anger and sorrow. He couldn't let her return to that house, not when her life was in danger. We have to find a way for you to leave, Kwame said quietly, his voice steady despite the turmoil inside him. You can't stay there anymore. Adain looked at him, her eyes wide with uncertainty. But where will I go? I have no one left, my mother is gone. Kwame reached out and gently touched her hand. You have me. I will protect you. We'll find a way. His words were simple, but they carried the weight of a promise that gave Adain a small glimmer of hope. For the first time in a long while, she wasn't alone. That night, Adain returned home but didn't sleep. Kofi was out drinking with his friends, and she knew that when he returned, he would be in a violent rage. She couldn't stay in that house anymore. Kwame's words echoed in her mind, giving her the courage to take action. She quietly packed a small bag with the few belongings she had, a faded dress, a pair of sandals, and a necklace her mother had given her as a child. She knew she couldn't take much, but what mattered most was her freedom. When Kofi stumbled through the door hours later, drunk and angry, Adain was already gone. Adain ran through the village, her heart pounding in her chest. The moonlight cast long shadows on the path as she made her way toward the forest. 
She knew she couldn't stay in the village, not while Kofi was looking for her. The forest seemed like the safest place to hide, at least for the night. She found a small clearing near the riverbank and sat down, pulling her knees to her chest. The sound of the flowing water was the only comfort she had. Her body trembled with fear, but she forced herself to stay calm. She couldn't afford to panic, not now. She had to survive. At dawn, Kwame found a Dane near the river. He had been worried sick all night, fearing the worst when he hadn't seen her at her stall. When he spotted her curled up by the water, he breathed a sigh of relief. He gently approached her, not wanting to startle her. You did the right thing by leaving, Kwame said softly as he sat down beside her. You're safe now. Adain looked up at him, her eyes filled with gratitude and exhaustion. She had been running for so long, running from Kofi, from her fears, from the pain of her mother's death. But sitting next to Kwame, she felt something she hadn't felt in years, safety. Kwame led Adain to his family's small hut on the outskirts of the village. His parents had passed away years ago, and he lived alone, spending most of his days hunting in the forest. The hut was simple, but it was warm and welcoming. For the first time in her life, Adain felt like she could breathe. You can stay here as long as you need, Kwame said, offering her a warm blanket. No one will find you here. Adain nodded, too overwhelmed with gratitude to speak. She looked around the small hut and realized that this was more than just shelter, it was a new beginning. That night, as Adain lay on the mat Kwame had laid out for her, she dreamt of the old woman again. The spirit of her mother appeared to her, just as she had at the market, but this time her face was filled with worry. My child, the spirit said softly, Kofi will not rest until he finds you. You must be careful. Trust in Kwame, but do not let your guard down. Dark forces are still at play. Adena woke with a start, her heart racing. The dream felt so real, as if her mother had truly been there. She looked around the small hut, the darkness of the night pressing in from all sides. Kofi was still out there, and she knew he wouldn't stop until he had her. Word of Adain's disappearance spread quickly through the village. Some speculated that she had run off with one of the village boys, while others whispered about Kofi's violent temper and wondered if he had finally pushed her too far. Kofi, in his drunken rage, told anyone who would listen that Adain was ungrateful, that she had abandoned him. But there were those who knew the truth. The village woman, who had seen the bruises on Adain's arms and the fear in her eyes, remained silent but exchanged knowing glances. They, too, had suffered under the weight of men like Kofi, and they hoped Adain had found freedom.